This is our first session in the anti-colonial perspectives on social work, social policy, and beyond. And I'm delighted to introduce Tanya Claybourne, who is one of the co-conveners of this session of our theme. And this is the first session. So Tanya, over to you. Beautifully done. Thanks for it, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, so. So I'm Tanya, some of you might know me, I was here two years ago already, when we started actually planning a bit uh, this, this focus of, of the series of lectures on decolonization. So it, it's really great that uh, it's it actually falling into place <laughs> and they're here together partly in presence and online. So yeah, today is, is the first part of three different sessions that have been set up basically for Paul and Gunnar who is here as well. And uh, today, I think that the, the title of our session is The State of the Art. Not sure whether we can fulfill this expectation, but we can, we can superficially at least try to touch on, on the state of the art. And um, yeah, I'm Tanya, I'm a social worker and sociologist. I teach at the University of Applied Sciences in Würzburg, Germany. And uh, I brought with me Rovel Afewoki Abai who is a PhD fellow at Humboldt University, also in Germany, uh, and he does research on intersectionality of ableism and racism. So great that you are here as well. And then um, Robel, I'm uh, sorry, Nikos Tupolutas uh, is our second presenter. I'm basically just introducing a bit and then take over the moderation. Now, Nikos uh, wasn't feeling well today in the morning. We have been in touch with him, and uh, maybe because he hasn't yet joined, I think um, he might not be able to come in. But let's hope for the best, and we'll start anyway, and and see how it goes. Anyway, we really hope to provoke a discussion on our theme today, and the more time we have for that, uh, the, the better as well, I guess. So, yeah. I'll start actually, and I brought yesterday we were talking about the need to reflect more about uh, texts and, of course, literature about yeah, post colonialism in our teaching. And hence, I decided spontaneously to bring um, a small part of a speech um, uh, to our session. And as I start um, with that, I will read it. And Robert, you have it, isn't it, in a, in a slide? So that everyone can can follow what I'm saying. Some people uh, find it easier to reflect if they read at the same time the text, and then we'll have a brief discussion about the text, and then uh, Robert takes over. What did uh, and later I'll, I'll ask you uh, who you think was the person who, who gave the speech. <laughs> I fear that the results of all the energies says by the prosperous of all kinds may be turned into a magic wand to be used to turn us back into a world of slavery, dressed up according to the taste of our times. This fear is justified by the fact that the African petit bourgeoisie with its diplomas, if not that of the whole third world, is not ready, whether because of intellectual laziness or simply because it has sampled the Western way of life to give up its privileges. It therefore forgets that all true political struggle requires a rigorous theoretical debate. And it refuses to do the thinking necessary in order to invent the new concepts needed to wage the kind of struggle to the death that is ahead of us. A passive and pathetic consumer group, it overflows with the inverts of the West just as it overflows with its whiskey and champagne in saloons where there is a dubious kind of harmony. One will search in vain the concepts of blackness or the African personality now being a little outdated for truly new ideas from the brains of our so-called intellectual giants. Words and ideas come to us from elsewhere our professors, engineers, and economists are content simply to add a little coloring because they have brought from the European universities of which they are the products only their diplomas and the surface of smoothness of adjectives and superlatives. 
It is urgently necessary that our qualified personnel and those who work with ideas learn that there is no innocent writing. In these tempestuous times, we cannot leave it to our enemies of the past and of the present to think and to imagine and to create. We also must do so. So, from which perspective did this person give? Well, it's part of a longer speech, of course. And so, my question to you uh, in the room or online is basically from which perspective was this person talking, you know? And, um, and uh, when might he have been given this? This speech, for example, in what timeline, you know, do you, do you set it? Was it during colonial times, after that, or just very recently? Um, and last but not least, do you think, you know, this, these arguments, this text is still relevant for what we want to discuss today? So we would just be keen to hear in a you know, few words uh, what you have been discussing, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll go over to Rubel. Who would like to start? Perhaps here in the room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. No, Give I, it a start. Oh, yeah. Summarize. That's always. No, no, well, I, relevant now, yes. Probably from the period, not now, <laughs> and not the period of immediate decolonial optimism. So the period of the first disillusionment. And I think it's probably Fanon. Fanon? Okay. But that's it. Yeah. But the blackness thing was a bit weird. Okay. Th thanks, Paul. Great. Um, who else would like to just briefly report back what we discussed? Yeah, we first discussed maybe that Putin doesn't know much about the topic and it seems irrelevant to us. But then, of course, we couldn't do something about Africa and so on. But then we discussed that it's very relevant also for the place uh, mm -hmm. where uh, we live, and especially in the region that we have, this, like, especially with this international NGO everywhere in the Balkans, it's a very, very um, mm -hmm. yeah, important thought. We said, oh, we said, yeah, we can't place it, and we're not so intelligent as police to name this name. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we, we, we said it would be relevant, yeah. At any time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, great. And the last one in the back? Or have you been I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, we also think that it's uh, relevant for any time, um, sadly, also today. And uh, we also do not uh, know a lot about the but it's more modern time. Mm -hmm. Recently, recently, more recently. Recently, recently. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. 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 Silence. So, so from the online sessions, anyone who wants to feedback? This is Jim. I, I just guessed it was from the immediate um decolonization period but um but but i wasn't sure okay so let's just <laughs> um lift the mystery uh, this was uh, this was a small part of a longer speech that thomas sankara gave at the u.n general assembly uh in 1984 and uh, for, for those who don't know Thomas, uh, Thomas Sankara, he was a Pan-African and anti-patriarchal 
revolutionary and also the fifth president of uh, at the time called Upper Volta, later Burkina Faso. He was actually uh, leading this process of, of giving a new name to the country, yeah, from Upper Volta to, to Burkina Faso. He lived, um, he was alive from 1949 until 1987, when he was still president of Burkina Faso, the fifth president actually, and he was killed, yeah. Um, possibly because of his political opinions and his radical thoughts against development aid, for example, an issue um, yeah, that is very much linked to the post-colonial discussions and international social work. So, yeah, I think um, as well, I have chosen this part of his speech because uh, he, at the time when he was talking in 84, he was referring to academics as passive and pathetic consumer groups uh, overflown with inverts of the West. Yeah. So this fits very well actually to what Robel is now going to present uh, on a critical perspective, I guess, how post-colonial uh, debates are being um, progressed at the moment in academia and, and social work specifically. Yeah. So over to you, Robel, after this short introduction. Thank you so much. So I think this is <laughs> No, it is fair, right? That's fine. I think, I hope. <laughs> um, I yeah. yeah, I think when you talk about um, critical concepts like decolonization, I think it's also not about talking black and white. It's more complex than that. But I think this introduction part also shows that um, how, how such critical concepts are um, taken over, like from marginalized, indigenous, colonized groups and taken for granted, like in academia. And mostly the very important part of this introduction is, for me at least when we were discussing, is to show also we want to decolonize something, although that means there has been a process of colonization. So when we want to decolonize and reclaim our intelligence, reclaim our knowledge systems, which are mostly in, indigenous, and reclaim our own um, sovereignty or autonomy. And then all of a sudden, academia, which is again very Eurocentric, so this is like the West taking over concepts like intersectionality and in this case, decolonization. And you know, we talk a lot about that. And when I was and discussing about this issue with Tanya, so we were talking about like who's speaking about, for instance, people's attitude in Germany. So we are also talking critically about that. So we have a lot of uh, discussion in on, on decolonization in Germany, but it's still a um, very eurocentric way of discussing about that. I don't know if you can follow me, but the point is when you need the concept of decolonization because this has been colonized, this has been Eurocentric, and then it comes to the point where you have white people or the West as, as a geopolitics on power talking about that. Those, this is like you talk about feminist theories and me or many other men just sit there and tell you how feminist um, ideas should work. So this is like very paradoxical and it also happened uh, actually on feminist uh, theories like intersectionality. So um, the point is, or the, the, the danger is um, that, you know, people hear a lot about that, especially not from marginalized groups, not from like people on power, uh, positions of power, <coughs> like academia. And then they talk like, we are discussing about, like many students tell me, like, we discuss a lot about decolonization and asking, like, Really? What do you discuss? So they say, like, yeah, we talk about refugees, like here, and something like that, you know. And then in the end, it's, it's also about how we are talking about that. So when we are talking about some topic, this is also very orientalistic, you know, very victimizing, like refugees. And um, when we talk about the, the idea of or the topic of migration, it's still also very eurocentric. So. I just collected some of the topics. Maybe some of you have 
yeah, have heard of that or in your seminars uh, or even online. So we have like Hegel analysis in spaces or academia or development education, feminism anyways, and knowledge and the curriculum. So when you go beyond these topics like decolonialism analysis in Africa, so we have all the mind. So we have to also see what has been again said on that. You know, we also see parallels like India or Africa or the global south in general that they are also appropriating this idea of um, this idea of um, power or this idea of colonial matrix of power. So it's not only like you know criticizing the West for what's happening, but it's also how we can also decolonize our own minds, you know, on, and reclaim our own way of thinking. So um, I hope this is going to be clear in the end when we talk about so social work, because it's still now, I can imagine it's very abstract and not clear, but when we later talk about um, social work practices, then we will also see like how important this is, you know, because we have a lot of, um, Orientalistic of racist colonial assumptions. So, for instance, when you talk about refugee being a refugee or refugee as, as such has gender, so you have like the male refugee, they per se are Muslim. So, when you talk about being refugee as a man, they always talk in the Western discourses as if you are just you know, Muslim. So, you feel like you, you think about Side and you think about even when you're Muslim, it's not at the same time, you know, a danger. But the idea is funny when you, when I talk to even at the university, when I talk to like friends, like, oh, what are you doing for Christmas? So I'm probably going to Frankfurt and we are like this and that. Do you celebrate Christmas? And I'm like, um, yes, I'm from Ethiopia, and trust me, Christian Christian is in Wales. They are in Ethiopia before <laughs> even in Europe. So this is also very funny way of ideas. You know, this is like also happening in the social world. People just in, in the Western society, they always think, don't reflect, but this is generally speaking, but they always think um, of certain uh, ideas, you know, which were white and from Norway and still a migrant in Germany, but they would never ask such things like that, you know, it's just like you said a word because this is something which is very obvious. So this is just maybe one example um, I have. So, yeah, the, the point is maybe we can, we have discussed with Tanya, maybe I don't want to talk the whole time about critical uh, theoretical uh, frameworks. Um, it's also already late and too warm. So maybe we could also make it like a dialogue where Tanya is also always commenting or you can stop me and we just, sort of um, discuss you know, not only like um, staying by, by, by the critic, but also to say like, how can we go forward and how can we, yeah, just a simple like, example of um, activities or way of um, thinking. So, um, yeah, this is maybe the first chance to, yeah, to say something, how to, I mean, like th this has been, very interesting, but when we talk about also like, you know, um, being, yeah, being passive and when we talk about like, like that, so I think it's also something to say. On the other side, I would say that the others, the other side of the coin is also like to be active and to reclaim also that being black and African and have a different way of thinking is also okay. And to also, you know, to also see, like, I, I remember my, my first um, bachelor at the, at the University of Addis Ababa, so which is like the first African university in, the, in Africa and whatever. So I mean, like, it's a very elite university and I have studied sociology. And I've, I'm, I'm really thankful for that, by the way, but I have learned Mark's paper, I have learned Tokheim, I have learned Foku anyways, since then, and I'm still, um, I'm still thankful and especially for both. But I have learned to know the work of Ashil Bembe in 2011 when I came to the University of Goethe in Frankfurt. So this is also like something which you would say, no, you know, this is also a way of being colonized even in the mind. So
So I have learned all the theories from Western society, but then I come back and I learn um, the BMB or 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 and Roger Bates, the clear case. So this is also yeah something we which I have or we have also to reflect um, like people socialized or come from the global uh, south as well. So maybe you want um, to comment on that, Tanika, or perhaps somebody else. Yeah, I guess I mean what, what we have been experiencing and Bobel and myself, we have been like yourself as well in a number of online conferences more recently on uh, border thinking and post-colonial um, debates. And what, what we've been discussing is that, you know, uh, post-colonial theory is getting more and more, whilst it has been at the margins, it, it gets more and more into the mainstream, yeah, of social science debates and, and social work discussions as well. And um, this mainstream debate means that it gets de-radicalized, that um, especially, uh, you know, its origin uh, of post-colonial theory, which goes back really to the critiques or that, that Marx, you know, brought forward on capitalism, is being um, sidelined, you know, and great level of, you know, what's been called uh, cultural turn and culturalism comes in, which refers to what Robel was saying, you know, uh, orientalism and assumptions, yeah, that refugees uh, are Muslims, are mainly masculine, um, and certain, you know, categories that are being applied, mainly cultural uh, categories and identity marks, so to say, yeah, and we get the feeling in the discussions, also in the social work discussions, yeah, on decolonization, uh, that this takes like the major part of the post-colonial discussions, and that, for example, um, yeah, questions of you know, uh, or critique on capitalism and and like the role really of of, of the market in in social work, the commodification um, of of life as such, you know, imperial lifestyles uh, that we increasingly adapt, you know, through exploitation. Uh, practices in the global south basically are being sidelined, yeah. And um, if if we would discuss these issues, yeah, with critical scholars in the global south, um, and this is increasingly happening actually. That there is a group of very critical scholars in the global south, in uh, on the African continent, uh, you know, in, in Asia and Latin America that starts criticizing, you know, what is happening uh, in, in Europe and this appropriation, as you has uh, called it at the beginning, you know, the post-colonial debate. And I think for us as critical, whatever social workers, this is something to really think about when we enter, you know, the whole issue of decolonization. Um, and, you know, where, where does the economy fit in here? It's not just a question of culture, really. It comes from uh, the critique of capitalism. I think that's a really important point which I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, Marx talks about contributing to the accumulation. And, and the whole kind of, as it were, the edifice of the global capitalist system is based around that moment at which we develop systems of exchange and commodity exchange. Yeah, the kind of basic political economy. And that's a kind of, I'll call it economic colonialism. But we don't talk about economic colonialism. And I think what's happened is we've reduced the decolonization of colonies into a culture, <laughs> which is the important, it was an important aspect of that, but in a sense, the starting point. I mean, the question is whether the imperialist or the colonialist goes, they're thinking, I'm going to culturally colonize these people, or whether they, they go there to say, how can I extract certain value? Uh, and then in the process of you know, how can I maintain my domination? Through some kind of psychological mechanism, which I think is where finance comes in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a bit like in the chicken next situation, but we've forgotten one bit of the chicken. We've either forgotten the chicken or the egg. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe that's, I think that's also a very good um, topic to discuss because um, we happen to forget maybe also um, because that's also, um, it doesn't happen this way because that's also part of. Uh, part of the business 
part of the colonial continuity. You know, that's also uh, something when you when you talk about yeah, the actual colonization. So it was a very cruel thing happened to, especially to um, black people and people of color. I mean, like really with the background of slavery. You know, this is also based on an idea of uh, inferiority, an idea of like yeah, being subjected to those community was not a question. I mean, like even from the countries who were not colonizing as as a such. So for instance, in Germany we talk about colonizing, colonization and we say like, but we didn't such a, we didn't somehow were involved with like UK or France and we, and then you take you, you discuss about that because you were not able economically. You don't have to be, I mean like this a contract of how they were you know like sort of and um, having Africa sort of um, dividing and then the, the only thing why Germany was not that involved in this business of colonizing colonization is because they were not able to you know economically able to pay for that as well. So I think it was not like an idea of like, oh, we are not going to somehow um, colonize Africa for some reason. So when it comes today, I think it's also the effect because um, it's very complicated. It's more, more subtle and more, more um, sophisticated how colonial continuities are working. When I come back to some African countries now, you see like a lot of Chinese in industries who are taking not only working places but also their own industries. So they also bought um, like uh, what you call it when you work for 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 right? like basically like really exploiting people, but still they are Chinese. So this must be, I mean like this is really for me like looking at back these structures, you know, it's like I don't know, this is not only poverty, but it's also more than that. This, close to slavery as well. So this is also some new structures or some new products of colonialism, what we see. And people are also, I mean, like many African countries, people are also, um, I mean, some, some, some authorities or some, some um, men, I would say, that made many my arguments on, on this power, on the position of power, are also benefiting. I mean, even the slavery would never be that successful if there was some of the countries who are cooperating in that case. I mean, so I think it's more than complicated than saying like it was the whites who were, you know, colonized, you know, who were the white. Of course, they have the um, position of power. And we, I would say, part of African state were, of course, dependent on these structures now, but there is also a group, a leader, African elite, there is also a group um, who are benefiting in, 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 in comparison to women, um, in comparison to, um, I don't know, queer people, in comparison to disabled people in this country. So I think this is also something that we can yeah. sort of maybe. Yeah. Can I just, I'm dying to share a tweet with somebody, one paragraph. <laughs> Yes, uh, which I don't know if anybody has come across Dr. Prima, Prima Pada, Gopalda, Cambridge University, was about the colonizer being attacked left, right, and centre by neoliberals and fascists. And this is a very recent tweet, it's about two days ago. And this much. But it's really, this thing, colonialism cannot have been sustained without the co option of the colonized subject, which is in the sense of what you're saying, yeah? This is my tip. Though the experience of elites is quite different to ordinary persons, who have, who have little to trade with their bodies of labor. So that's kind of, so, I mean, in a sense, you haven't got much of a choice if you've only got your body or your labor to feed your children. You know, this is what she says. She says, the great anti colonialists understood that colonization always involved the collaboration of colonial elites and native elites, and that so called indigenous tyrannies and native tyrannies have to be brought into the frame of decolonization as much as white as some Yeah, thanks. And it, I think really to the point as well, and it, you know, it refers back to what Thomas Sankara was actually yeah, yeah. saying in 84, and Paul has been writing and say, in a sense, he was saying, you know, this is the time of disillusionment, yeah? Mm -hmm. After the revolutionary pan-African time of 
of decolonization, yeah, which is an unfinished project, of course, and um, that's something in mind. Um, yeah, Mahmoud Mamdami, yeah, the, the old rule, you know, the vida de carry, divide and rule, yeah, uh, which refers actually to this relationship, yeah, of the, the European uh, colonizers, you know, starting the colonizing project actually with co opting yeah, traditional leaders or traditional, you know, governance systems in on the African continent, for example. And this kind of uh, alliance, you know, between, uh, yeah, Elites in Europe and on the African continent, that's just where, where I more kind of have more experiences, continues until today. So the, the relevance, you know, of what I brought in at the beginning from the speech is is, is more actually uh, relevant than ever, yeah. If you think about the level of exploitation that happens, for example, uh, in the global south, increasingly since the last economic crisis in 2008, actually. And um, you know, how how local elites, of course, uh, collaborate with multinational companies and, and the like, you know, leading to, especially in sub-Sahara Africa, yeah, to an increase in poverty and incredible levels of inequality that we, we cannot even understand sitting here, um, even from a Bal Balkanian perspective, so to say. But, but in some sense, it's, it's kind of, I mean, history sometimes, often slowly, you know, the Decades, but there's something I think in the last 15 years maybe that the failures of a lot of African uh, you know, decolonizing projects in mean, uh, South Africa is the best reason. But in South America, what's happening in terms of the decolonization of South America and how that's been reappropriated? And India is a good example where uh, you know when there was fascism in the name of decolonization, it's a certain itself. So it's not the same word decolonization in British, but from the locals as well. Uh, and so you've got this strange kind of uh, China talks about the kind of deep, even, even the, the what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment, the Taliban has said we are a decolonial movement. We want to get rid of all these things. Yeah? ISIS, you were using um, Edward Said's work. I, I just literature where they quote Saeed, uh, and, and so you've got this strange kind of almost appropriation of decolonization by fascists, and which are new imperialists, maybe, and also neoliberals, and sometimes working together. Strange, strange. So it, it just highlights as well, you know, this huge need to, you know, think about these key terms, you know, imperialism, colonialism, you know. What is its origin and how do we apply these terms? You know, uh, it's not just north south, you know, we can discuss this in an eastern context, you know, as much as we can discuss it nowadays between north and south. We have one question from Verena. I was just remembering that a couple of days back I listened to a podcast which is called Decolonized Social Work, it's based in the US. And they ac were actually talking about a text from that was written by Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Young. And what they state in this text, I haven't read it. I was able to find it uh, just very quickly in preparation for this contribution. But anyway, what they say is if we talk about decolonization, we have to talk about giving back land. Otherwise, it's just empty words. And this is, of course, based in a settler colonialist context. But I was really, um, how should I say? I think it, it really makes a very important point um, because it says we have to see action. We actually have to think about returning, about um, actually listening to, to what has happened and, and about making uh, um, how do you say that? Yeah, giving back restitutions and so on. So I find this really interesting. I'm planning to read this text and I think it's, it's really interesting also to think about what does that mean in Europe, for example, or what does it mean for the African continent or Asia and so on. Uh, I, I think Verena is making a very important point here, really, on, you know, the land question is crucial and we have a session, isn't it, on, on the land movement. But, but I think that, that's an important question, but it's a very difficult question. 
because I mean, if you see what happened in Zimbabwe uh, and, 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 and the whole policy of you know kind of taking white settler land, that it wasn't going to kind of all <laughs> elites, yeah. So that's part of the problem. And, and if you if you look at say in terms of Aboriginal uh, uh, and, and native Native Americans or Native in Canada. It's not about a personal ownership of land, it's about the collective ownership of land. So what does it mean to give back land? Is it to a nation? Is it to a people? And these are interesting questions, I think. You know, will, should anybody own land? And that's all, because it's not the only instrument to presume. So no, I mean, the, the question of post-colonial justice, you know, we could add the discussion of compensation payments, for example, where you know in Germany it's it's a very hot issue at the moment because we are paying compensation for example uh, to to Jewish families you know affected um, uh, and and you know uh, brought to death during the Second World War uh, and the Nazi regime uh, but the genocide that happened in Namibia for example you know which was one of the biggest genocides on, on the African continent led by, you know, uh, Germany, um, German Empire <laughs> uh, at, at the time, or what, what they were trying to build up actually in this process of imperialism, um, is, is, is being uh, looked at in very different ways, you know. Um, we are giving development aid, for example, to Namibia instead of compensations, which the, you know, Nama uh, people are actually, uh, you know, uh, asking uh, in, in relation to the German government. So these are all, you know, very relevant questions on post-colonial justice, land, you know, compensation payments and so on. Although, I mean, there's a very big debate raging in America about the politics of uh, reparations and saying that the danger of this is that you can somehow uh, excuse people for the inhumanity by the they were paying off that government. Uh, you can never compensate for uh, those genocides. So you have to find a way of not, as it were, uh, whitewashing history because we've paid our dues. Yeah? You can never pay your dues. But the question is, you know, how seriously are we listening to the groups that are making these demands? You know, I'm... I think this is highly important. Yeah, I mean, I'm in between part of the room. I, I think that what this debate shows is that you can't think about decolonialism in a in a short-term time scale you actually have to think of decolonialism in a very long dure kind of sense whether that's about reparations or whatever it's not just about thinking in the present right it's about understanding deeply it's fine yeah. well. you, can have, you can have short terms and long term yeah. if somebody's drowning you don't say well for saving the long term I think this is also an important the last point uh, for me, uh, what Ben now is also uh, mentioning. I mean, it's what you are talking about is the dimension of time, like what we need, but also what sort of decolonization are we talking about? Like the last point, what I want to mention actually with Clelia, um, Clelia Rodriguez, who um, wrote book Decolonizing Academia, Poverty, Oppression, and Pain talks about, like, a situation from her 1,000 sacrifice later, you are a university professor. I mean, on this part, she talks about in her book how hard it is even to get the chance to come to, to as a woman of um, color, I, I mean, like, obviously from the global south, and how hard it is even to have your own voice, you know, even as a scholar. So, what happens is that, I mean, this is also a very cynical paradox, how we talk a lot in social work, keeping voice. So normally I also ask like, how are you supposed to keep voice for the other word, which I cannot stand anymore in social work practices or workshops is empowerment. Mostly white people trying, white social worker, white professors trying to empower marginalized subaltern groups. So this is like as I mean really as a black person, as a black social worker, a black 
black scholar. I think this is something which is so somehow yeah, dehumanizing because people are telling you how they can empower you, you know, instead of all oh, giving voice, instead of giving space. So this is also what I like the book from Rodriguez because she also critically analyzes how hard it is to get to academia. So I know some, somehow you get the chance also to speak for you, for yourself. At the same time, when you talk about social work, I think we have to also talk about like you were mentioning, we have to talk because our clients know actually what is best for them. So maybe we have to overcome our categories of victimizing, for instance, Muslim women and victimizing um, a refugee woman, you know, they have, they have also their own uh, strategies, how they survive um, interlocking forms of oppression. So when we, you know, on the, when I would say the West is on the, on the one hand, the colonizing, even in neo in neocolonized colonial structures, but at the same time, they also want to be part of the white savior, you know? So this is also something which is, doesn't fit actually, you know, you want to save the world, but at the same time, you are also exploiting actually the global south. So this is, I don't have an answer, but I think this could be also like a, a starting point when we discuss about, we talk about theory, but how does it affect my job actually, you know, as a social worker? This is um, a lot of students also ask, I think uh, this is also a very important question, you know, otherwise it just stays in our bubble and, and academia and that's also important and that's also what I mostly say because I am not from the practice, so I cannot say how it should work in the practice, but there are a lot of people having these resources, having these experiences, so this is also, it should be more, more or less like a dialogue and um, like also, it's also a long term, a long term project, so um, you can change 500 years of exploitation and uh, rationalization and I don't know, tomorrow or next year, that would be really nice. Um, Tanya, maybe you meant to I mean, I want to speak. I mean, for said it's a long term project here, yeah, but it should be also a, a, an urgent project here. Yeah. I mean, because I was, I mean, you said that I was, of course, connecting it to the institutionalization. It's, mm. it's the same similar topic here. Yeah, we need an urgent response to yeah. abolish this, <laughs> this practice. Yet, who, who should not be happening, and on a long term plan way, we will never be able to repay for what has been done to people for living in institutions for several and dying there and their family, not about just people living there, but also their family, everyone. And it should be a long term uh, project and, yeah, you know, yeah. change it. In the UK, there was a great example of that with the disability tracks movement. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be academics talking about several people, their rights and all kinds of theories. Uh, but nobody really was kind of engaging with several people. Uh, so the disability rights movement emerged. And they were saying, we don't want your theory. We just want to help disabled people escape from institutions. So that, their intervention was actually arranging for people to be taken out of institutions, direct action. And it was because of that that you then saw the government closing down these institutions very quickly. They said, we haven't got time for new things. We have people are dying mm -hmm. in residential institutions and we have to break down the doors and literally and take them out. And that's what we do. So I think that, that's a really important point. Yeah, it is. There is no, like, it shouldn't be, it's not even a project, but an immediate urgent. It's not a theoretical problem yeah. for people who are dying. So I think that's a really, I think a, a brilliant point, uh, but a very sad, you know, issue actually now uh, to to hand over really to, to Nikos, who is with us as well, um, also online, who is going to talk uh, or build the bridge, you know, from our discussion on, which has been so far a bit theoretical, uh, post-colonial theories and, and how relevant it might be to social work and we're now starting you know to to apply this more concretely yeah to to a field of social work and 
social work in the migration management system is something which uh, is increasingly expanding in Europe uh, since 2015. And yet Nikos is sitting on, on the island of, of Lesbos now, um, where he has been doing research on um, the impact yeah, of uh, European migration management, um, the oppression yeah, that we can see and the number of deaths. I think I don't need to refer to that in detail. All of you are, you know, following the media, how many people are, you know, dying or, you know, are being led to die basically because of, you know, uh, pushbacks or, or uh, lack of support yeah, for, for people that are, um, yeah, on the move basically towards Europe. Uh, and, and this is, of course, you know, linked uh, to the history of colonialism, to economic exploitation to uh, the huge levels of inequalities yeah, between regions uh, worldwide. And uh, this is increasing basically, but inequality within countries is actually increasing, uh, decreasing, sorry, but between regions, yeah, inequalities are increasing and it's very much linked to the colonial project. And genocide. Yeah. It's a genocide process. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, um, I think Nikos is really the right person to bring us now or to break down, you know, what we have discussed rather theoretically uh, on the example really of migration management and uh, how, you know, this kind of colonial matrix yeah, works um, within the migration management system. So really over to Nikos, Greg, that you, you can join us now. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I first of all, I apologize for not being there, uh, kind of in person. Uh, it was. It's not that I couldn't make it. I I had the tickets in hand, everything, and then I got a horrible stomach bug, and uh, that kind of kept me uh, here. So I missed my tickets. I couldn't travel. So I'm really sorry uh, for not being able to be there presently. Uh, now, also, I will try and keep it very short uh, because I know it's late and uh, you most probably had a very uh, long day. And um, so let's let's get in the in the, in the heart of, of uh, the whole issue. Now, we're talking about uh, decolonization. Essentially, we're talking about the the power that is exerted uh, from individuals within uh, kind of uh, academia, within kind of social work uh, on refugees, okay? Uh, that is very, very important to, to start with, okay? We need to, obviously all of us are in more or less on the same page. So we do understand that uh, we are not uh, a guilt-free kind of uh, kind of group trying to save the world. Uh, we know that, so we're starting, you know, uh, from page two on, on this one. Now, uh, how do we see that in the refugee crisis? First of all, the refugee crisis is a big, the refugee situation in itself, okay, is a unique problem in the sense that the refugee architecture from day one is about depoliticizing the political. This is what the refugee situation is about since day one. Since the day uh, in 1951, when they kind of uh, created that, uh, you know, masterpiece of a convention, okay, which was essentially about American Soviet antagonism, was never about refugees, it was never about that, it was only about kind of embarrassing Soviet states, because they were dealing with the undesirables by kind of essentially undermining their civil rights. Okay, uh, but that's why the key word in, in the entire convention is about, uh, you know, persecution. Okay, the, the West was not persecuting people, it was simply starving them, you know, as you do with you know, black people in the United States. If social rights were introduced in the convention, then the entire black population of the United States would leave the place. Okay, so it's, it's a very, very political uh, kind of project, the entire refugee uh, architecture, and it is presented as a non-political uh, issue. It is presented as uh, an issue of humanitarianism. It's anything but. So it is a great context 
the refugee crisis, okay, as we call it, is a great context in which violence can happen, epistemic violence can take place, okay? It's the ideal context for that. Now, in, in what ways do we see that? There are loads of ways now, there are loads of things we can talk about refugee management from, you know, from now to, you know, 10 days later. It's very important to focus on something, however. And I will focus on one key concept, and that is the one of post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? Now, PTSD is the number one thing that we're discussing here on the ground, okay? Uh, and this is, and I, it has been argued for many years now, okay? One of, I would say, this is the epitome of what we call epistemic violence, okay? Now, the idea of trauma, first of all, now, it's not a problem in itself. Many people discuss about trauma. Obviously, the key word here in the, is PTSD is that P, you know, that post-traumatic, you know, stress disorder. What is this post? What does this post mean? Okay. Uh, well, actually, what it means is not really as important as was what it stands for and what it tries to hint on. And what it hints on is that essentially we have a space where trauma happens, and that is the global south, okay? A space where trauma happens, and that is the non-Western kind of uh, situation where people, women are traumatized, children are traumatized, okay? This is in the past. When they move inside Europe, okay? Now this is a post-traumatic, so trauma ends, okay? Now that implies that trauma is not actually taking place inside refugee management, which is the most absurd thing you can ever think about, especially if you enter a refugee camp. There's nothing more traumatic than a refugee camp, okay? So you have this kind of trauma that still takes place, but no, it's a post-traumatic stress disorder. And most importantly, the one thing which is really, really, neo-colonial and, and, and shocking is this, this image of the world where the West is a healing agent, okay, of the various traumas that are taking place in the yet uncivilized South, global South. The obvious example of that, okay, and this neo-colonial, another kind of thing is the issue of gender this absolutely unthinkable idea of gender. In Greece, where I'm, I'm talking to you from, and that's where we have all the kind of various kind of camps where people are um, kind of held, and uh, we're discussing about uh, the need of refugees to understand gender equality, okay? In Greece, in a country when in 2021, we have lost count of femicides. We literally have lost count of how many women have been killed, Greek women, by their Greek husbands, by their Greek boyfriends. And yet the discussion, okay, in Europe, well, during, during the entire kind of uh, period of the kind of quarantine, okay, throughout the world, if you've, if you've seen, okay, because many people were kind of living online, essentially, okay, pornography skyrocketed. People were visiting pornographic sites nonstop. And here in the West, we're discussing about gender rights that refugees do not appreciate because we in the West are champions of gender equality. This is just absurd. This is the most neocolonial thinking you could possibly imagine. So neocolonialism in refugee management is actually goes hand in hand neocolonialism with refugee management. We have people who are perceived as broken because of their uh, kind of uh, their kind of birth in, in a space in the world where you know we don't have human rights uh, being respected as much as the West. The West is there to uh, to heal, 
And the worst thing that we do as social workers, as those in the field, is we try uh, to enhance this vulnerability of refugees because the whole idea of getting that golden ticket to be in Europe is based on you being presented as vulnerable as you could possibly be. So PTSD syndrome is something that lawyers and people who are working with refugees are, are really trying hard to establish because the image of the refugee is this helpless individual that is in need of Western assistance. Western white male assistance, but Western assistance. So that is essential and that is where our role comes in because the, uh, the architecture of the refugee uh, kind of, uh, well, the, the entire kind of refugee concept, especially from the 70s onwards, is based on this uh, kind of uh, vulnerable individual, this passive vulnerable individual. And we are entering this in an effort to help refugees gain you know, their uh, kind of way out of, you know, the camp into Europe. And we essentially try to force this role on them, this role of the passive victim that is in need of care. And that is something really, really important because not much room is left for people who work on the ground and are pro-refugee, if you want to call it that way, apart from actively taking part in the victimization of refugees. So it is epistemic violence on the one hand, but let's not think that epistemic violence happens because there is an evil kind of white male social worker that wants to victimize refugees, is that you're left with no options inside this context. So that's why the, the architecture uh, of the refugee status, essentially, okay, pushes people in the acceptance of this thing. More or less, that's what I would like to, to say very, very shortly. And now we can have a discussion, you know. Uh, I, I can't hear. Now, okay, you have to mute. Yes. <laughs> now, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot, Nikos, for, for sharing your insights and, you know, for greatly actually linking up what we've been discussing on post-colonialism, you know, with the entire... Uh, policy area of migration management and of course as well the role of social work you know within migration management and I think this is most probably the most relevant area of social work practice you know when we talk about decolonizing social work we really need to think about you know what what Nikos has been saying in terms of us playing an active role you know as social workers in um, uh, you know building up this vulnerability, you know, being part of accepting and implementing uh, the vulnerability criteria, you know, which, uh, as, as Nikos has, has highlighted, you know, um, lead to increased possibility yeah, to have your asylum process uh, accepted or to be able to move on to a Central European country. And yet, you know, this plays into this post-colonial image yeah, of the, you know, uh, traumatized person, which obviously comes from the global south and not from a detention center or a hotspot center, you know, at the EU external border, um, and and many other issues, yeah, that, that Nikos mentioned. And I, I think it would be a good moment now, perhaps, you know, to do, use the last moments we have for the session to really reflect a little bit how this resonates, you know, with your own. Uh, practice experience with your own insights, you know, into social work in Europe. And, you know, we would certainly be interested as well to hear whether this connection, you know, of 
the post-colonial reflection we have had at the beginning, you know, resonates with practice experiences of social workers in migration management and what, you know, would be our conclusion? What do we need to do, you know, to overcome um, these problems uh, that, that Nikos and, and oppressions, you know, that we are involved in concretely as social workers? Diana has a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thank you very much for the presentation. It really resonated with me a lot and I gained also new insights. And I actually have an example for what you just said, like the victimization for refuge of refugees, how that continues within Europe. I live in the Netherlands in a quite small town and there was actually an initiative founded by refugees, led by refugees who were trying to establish a sort of... Uh, a counseling center for refugees, not only that, like a networking connection neighborhood counseling center. Mm -hmm. It was led by a psychologer, um, psychologist, sorry, who, who came here from Syria, like a very experienced man and so on. And he tried to, to make this initiative more than just a neighborhood center because there was a lot of professional expertise. But he did not succeed in receiving funding from the municipality. So I must say, I do not know the whole story, but I have, of course, um, heard uh, a lot of stories from his side on how, and I've personally, I think that there was a lot of this idea of they are not able to do that, playing into it, if not, probably not consciously, but on the subconscious level. So, and that was quite um, devastating also to see, to be honest. And and also these, the stories that I hear from refugees here in the Netherlands are exactly like, it, it's exactly what you just explained, that this idea of victimizing, uh, patronizing, uh, paternal, how do you say that? Patronizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that this continues on every single level. Yes, and later on, uh, of course, it's uh, very uh, easy to go on, and that's an interesting kind of uh, research angle, to go on into specific occupations that they demand from you a certain amount of deference, a certain amount of subjection exactly. to the will of the employer. So you have a passive individual that is created through this refugee management, which is ready to enter this realm of the labor market, which is kind of made just for people, you know, what we call low status labor, essentially, you know. So it's it's uh, kind of kind of brings in also that uh, kind of um, issue. Yeah. yeah, please continue. Sorry. No, I, yeah, I definitely agree. So no, this is just the experience that I had here. And it's not just I'm originally from Austria. I had the same experience there. I had the experience here. So this is the way how the institutions work. This is yeah. the way how um, and social work is deeply embedded in it and contributes, as you just said, to the uh, victimization of the, the people who are defined as refugees. And I was lucky to actually um, do an internship at an organization that is for uh, founded by migrant women, mig women with a, a migration background, who actually introduced me to a very different approach of social work. And I'm very grateful for this experience. And very simply put their ideas, and they really live up to it. Everyone is an expert of their own lives. But not just words, you know, you hear that a lot in social work. But what they said is, yeah, sometimes it's hard to, 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 um, except if a person that you just uh, try to give advice makes a decision that you think personally it's not good for them. But you are not the one to judge because you don't see the full picture. This person is the expert of their lives and we have to respect. And of course, this is not a coercive context. I mean, they, they, have the, they have some freedom in their, um, uh, in their way that they, they counsel and so on. And there is some 
coercions, of course, there is some rules that people have to follow and so on. But, you know, just, just experiencing that you can do it differently. And this is actually something that I found in my own research on epistemic violence in social work as well, that we all have a choice, even though if the system is very coercive, it's, it's very violent. We ourselves, the way how we encounter people, how we talk to people, this can make a small difference. I do not say this is enough because it's not enough because the system that the institutions have to change. But what I also found is that if uh, social workers, I, I did some research with social workers and if they feel that they personally cannot do anything, if they don't see their own agency and if the system gets like this huge um, idea, of course it is huge, I do not uh, deny its impact, but always there is a little space that you can inhabit. And in order to do that, you have to decolonize your mind, or at least it's an, an ongoing process. But yeah. you have to look at your own prejudices, at your own racism and so on. I, I, I agree 100% uh, with, uh, with that. Uh, based on what you said, and thank you very much for the kind of, because it was a kind of slightly dark kind of presentation in the sense of, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, how horrible things are, and they are indeed uh, disgraceful. But uh, I do believe that there is a, there is a way out. And, and one way out, spe specifically speaking about PTSD and all this kind of issue, is to try and defetishize this idea of trauma. Because trauma is about the medicalization of a normal response to an abnormal situation, okay? Trauma is not a medical consideration per se. And it's very important now, especially for those who are into kind of social work with issues of mental health, go back to our Martin Baro. Okay, Martin Baro is a very, very important uh, Jesuit kind of uh, psychologist uh, who kind of wrote on the issue of how mental health can be best uh, essentially be uh, kind of served uh, by collective action, okay, and by creating collectivities with a strong political understanding. And for, he gave this famous example for, uh, you know, which is, okay, we're looking at, at children at El Salvador, which was where he was mainly kind of uh, working at. And children in El Salvador are facing these this great problems of, of you know, uh, trauma and, and all these things, and, and they feel quite powerless. And we, we switch kind of sides and we go to the Palestinian children, okay? in the Gaza Strip. And we're looking at this and we're not looking at this trauma, not at the level that exists in other places, okay? What is the difference? Why is it that Palestinian children, okay, are not facing this trauma? And the result is, his, his answer is that due to the whole kind of situation that exists in kind of the Palestinian crisis, you have a very specific political understanding of what is happening and a very specific political action. And that actually enables children to look past the horrors in a personal way and understand them in a social way and act in a political way. And that, I'm not saying gives a necessarily a solution, obviously there's none, okay? Palestinians are being you know, slaughtered on a, on a monthly basis, but still, this creates room for people, you know, to rise beyond this, this victimhood that is created by Western science. And let's not forget about, you know, psychology and our Foucault, you know, about psychology being the ultimate discipline that is created on the purpose of social, on the purpose of social control. I think um, I, I just want to make two points, two comments on what Nikos has been said, and then Bernard talked about this idea of not um, having given the space for that. And I, as uh, Nikos was talking about the meeting, yeah, um, the construction of trauma, I was also thinking about social work practices. You know, you always need also sort of new projects in social work. I mean, otherwise, it's, what are we then as social workers? You know, when you don't have the project, uh, then there's no need for your interventions. So we always, I mean, social work 
was social democratics was also part of the national socialism. I mean, like you know, you know, you have to go with the system. So um, to be even on the darker side again, but. At the same time, what I find very interesting is, as Verena was talking about, I think the Netherlands experience, because you know you can also put it for some of you who don't know, uh, women in exile. This is a refugee, self-organized refugee woman organization. Women in exile is in Berlin since I think the 90s. So they are actually really well organized. So it goes very well with the feminist activist movement actually worldwide, you know, when we talk about um, when we talk about exploitation or when we talk about um, um, injustice. So there is also a gender question. So these refugee women um, have been organized and say like we as a refugee with the construction of refugee are doing different experiences like even in the camp we are experiencing violence by the security, by even the refugees themselves. So they said we have also specific issues. So we can talk about vulnerability as a group, but, and then they, they just somehow reconstruct actually what is vulnerability and how it happens. Or, um, you know, even the, the how to go forward because they are living it, you know. And then the funniest thing is they cannot even get any, any assistance, any, um, they organize like, workshops, they organize a lot of things, but this is only based on fundings. So I find it also very interesting, you know, when we talk about vulnerability, so we have an idea or Western idea of what is vulnerability, which groups are vulnerable, and how can we deal with that? No therapy whatsoever, but when they say like, we need safe spaces, we need to go out of this situation, you know, out of this camp. So then again, they're like, um, you know, and then you feel like, you are talking about empowerment. So these people, this, I mean, like the most vulnerable groups, uh, refugee women are actually giving political um, political um, questions for them to say, like, we need to go out of this, this um, uh, camp. So then this has never been had. So they are on, on um, a strike in Berlin. They have been always having trouble with us. So I think this is the whole idea of um, who is vulnerable and how we deal with that. I think that's also what you have been discussing, you know. They, they have their own their answers, but yeah, then, and then you ask yourself, what are we going to do with that? I mean, with this answer, so, yeah. Can I just come in on this question of agency? I think it really is a comp complex question. And it links in a lot of things about empowerment, you know, uh, and, and pathologization of the individual because he's talking about. Yeah. And I remind you of something, I think it was Marx that said something like people make their own history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. And I think what Marx is saying there is that ultimately the whole point of liberation of is, is to validate and validate people's agency. And the sense of utopia was. In a, in a socialist utopia, we would all, we could, we could just exude the agency, that's all we would do, yeah, to do the big creative and dancing and whatever we want to do. So the question isn't whether somebody has or doesn't have agency. I think what Marx would say, everybody has agency, but that agency can be diminished in the sense that that, that person's capacity to exercise what is inherently part of your human beingness can be diminished. So I think there's a danger that we see as either or. I think you know, it's kind of both. There is, I would definitely agree with you. There is this concept I've been looking for it now, but I cannot find, you know, when I'm looking for it. There is this very interesting concept of victimhood. I don't know if you know it. So there is like a, a combination of victimhood and agency. I'm not really um, done with those already, but I think this could be also a very interesting way of like to, maybe to overcome this binary of victim and mm -hmm. agents. But I think this victimcy is also like a concept showing also this, yeah, this intersectionalities as well, you know. So because that, that quote that you had from um, the Indian uh, writer earlier on. Out of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, which in a sense makes that point. She says that people are not silent. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're silent. 
They're silenced. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the same point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. We can also talk about in the Bay, of course, that's also part of the, the black and yeah. the, 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 the other uh, book um, um, on black indigenous and all idea of this, like who is being silenced and who, about uh, whom uh, voice are we talking about actually? Which voice? Yeah. So. Great, I think we're really coming into a very important discussion now for social work specifically. And Paul wants to come in as well. Yeah, I, do, I mean, three things. Nikos, thank you so much for deconstructing the discourse of trauma, because I do think that this notion that refugee camps are actually non-spaces between the trauma of the global south and the healing of the global west is is incredibly important and that we, we fail to recognize it and and you brought it front and center in in very dramatic details um and of course that also works when the professionals talk about secondary trauma so you can be traumatized in refugee camp but that's secondary to the real trauma of your original experience right so let's just think about how these words work right the other thing was that I think the victimization thing is very important, but of course one also gets the, the selection of those refugees who may be productive, who have qualifications, who can work in jobs that they are overqualified for in, in the West. So there's a much more complicated material dimension to this. But, but I wanted to say two more things very quickly. One is that I think this epistemic violence thing has really linked so many of the things that we've been talking about already in, the, in, in this course. And I am, I am beautifully amazed at the connection between deinstitutionalization, self-organization, and decolonization. And I said I'd only say two things, but one more thing is that I think a lot of people have been referring to literature and writers and inspiring writers that just do not come anywhere near social work curricula in the West and the East. And that this is actually so important in terms of, you know, rethinking, rethinking what we mean by the No, thanks, Paul. I mean, these, I mean, you, you brought some key issues to the point and, um, you know, we've been looking at the theme of decolonization now at various levels, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, pan-African theories of decolonization. Uh, yeah, we are talking about, you know, the co-option of the entire concept uh, within academia and social sciences specifically, of course. Concretely, you know, in the area of migration management, we can see this link between neocolonialism and migration management. And of course, the labor market needs, you know, that the West continues to help in order to you know, continue its economic growth agenda, which is linked, you know, uh, to the entire hegemonial, you know, imperial project of, you know, extending capitalism. And we are, we are at a point, actually, of this, you know, imperial project where, you know, even, you know, some of these basic essential principles, you know, I was, when I came in, I just read about Europe and, you know, identity in Europe, isn't it? There's another conference. And we were ironically saying, you now we are talking about migration management in Europe. What does this tell us? You know, these human rights abuses going on, you know, the, you know, the kind of post-traumatic stress uh, and mental health issues that social workers are dealing with, you know, and uh, in a very individualized way, you know, in terms of case management, you know, rather than looking at it from a structural, sociological and economic, political economic anchor, actually. So there are so many issues, I would say, you know, that uh, need to be reflected upon, um, both in theoretical terms, but actually much more and very, very urgently in terms of uh, practice and it's of course linked, you know, how how do we teach, you know, what, what are we teaching, how are we teaching, you know, and um, um, how, how do we actually uh, decolonize our curriculum, you know, and I think that's perhaps, you know, a point where much more needs to happen very soon because that will automatically, you know, lead to how practice is perceived, conceptualized, which approaches are being supported, um, and, and all of you that are, and I'm 
still like I was just one week actually, but I wanted to be one week in Berlin. I ended up being there just for two days visiting different organizations, yeah, social work organizations involved uh, in supporting um, refugees in Berlin. And I saw exactly, you know, this possibility actually of agency. Yeah? There were social workers in government institutions resisting, you know, um, municipality regulations, uh, subversive ways of doing things differently, even so there was a policy to do it in another way, building alliances, you know, uh, or referring, you know, refugees to a place where they learn about church asylum or, you know, other kind of ways of uh, yeah, resisting, you know, what, what legal was is referring to. And, and these different, you know, types of social work exist and the question for us as lecturers and practitioners uh, is basically, you know, what, what side do we take? Yeah? And uh, what, what level of analysis do we have in order to change our practice and position ourselves, you know, closer to, to those that are oppressed in, in the system, as Nikos has highlighted. And maybe so let's take another two. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so we have, I mean, just in terms of timing, we have another 15 minutes. So let's just see what other comments and questions are coming in. Jim. Who was just raising the hand? Jim, Jim isn't it? Jim, yeah. Please go ahead. So um, for me, the elephant in the room is the thing we're not discussing is whether social work can actually be decolonized. Um, it's inherently in its origins, it's a colonial venture. Um, you know, in the, I'm, I'm in the United States. In the United States, we cite the origins of social work in um, friendly visiting, which were, you know, white people going into the homes of, uh, 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 European white people going into the homes of poor people and telling them what they're doing wrong and what they should do right uh, and how they could do it, you know, right. Um, and settlement houses, which were also, you know, privileged European wasps um, going into the homes of immigrants and people of color and, and again, trying to show them, help them do what they thought was, was better. So are we inherently a colonial venture? And you know, there, there's some organizational theory, for example, that says that uh, organizations and professions are imprinted at their birth with certain things and they really can't be changed. And so the only thing you can do is kill it off and start all over again um, to, to have a, a really significant um, change in that. And I'm reminded of the times that I've tried to use Illich's essay, Disabling Professions um, in Teaching Social Work, which um, highlights all professions, but especially um, relevant for social work. And it's about how professions systematically uh, disable people rather than enable people. And, um, you know, so if, if these kinds of things are inherent to both social work as a profession and social work as an academic field, which is also embedded in Western um, colonial and imperialist um, structures, um, can we in fact really decolonize it or should we be trying to do something else? That's it. <laughs> I think that's a that's, sorry, sorry, Trump. I think that's a that's a marvelous uh, input and right to the right to the point. Uh, you know, uh, so thank you very much for that comment. Uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I I I think uh, one one way is to to utilize our knowledge uh, that we have uh, gained and move outside uh, our uh, specific institutional frameworks. And uh, what kind of frameworks this would be? Uh, I think that's where uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the, the previous person that was making a comment about the connection of uh, institutionalization and deinstitutionalization, uh, de and you know uh, how essentially uh, is it Paul? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, how essentially we need to move outside uh, the institutional comfort zone and. Uh, uh, 
uh, I don't care about the label that will be given, but self-organization uh, along with uh, refugees, uh, where refugees are the ones who uh, kind of point the way uh, and we follow, regardless what we, whether we like this or not. And there are inherent dangers in that, but we're willing to follow them. You know, and that is where I think the answer is. Please, Jim, please. Can I also add that I think it's ironic that we're talking about post-traumatic stress, which itself is an American <laughs> colonial <laughs> categorization of, of anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shell shock was better when they used they used to war uh, in the first world war was shell shock. That was uh, that was good. That was a good word. You know. <laughs> Yeah, so, so thanks a lot. And let's perhaps not forget about, you know, some of the radical social web traditions, you know, that do exist as well. Uh, Saul Alinsky's, you know, Rules of the Radicals and, and other traditions that emerged, you know, social web closage, social movements. Tim, you were referring, you know, to social web being an, an, an import or an export, you know, to, to the global south. But as we talk, you know, there are so many different kinds of social works just in Latin America, the tradition of, of Palo Freire, you know, on the African continent, we have this rich discussion about, you know, indigenous knowledge and uh, African philosophies, you know, Ubuntu, how, how it can be uh, contributing, you know, to another type of um, social work. Uh, and I think here in Europe, you know, we are now talking from a European kind of uh, perspective, I guess, also in a critical way, you know, we need to take these developments much more serious and not say, you know, another social work is not possible, because if we do this, you know, we are taking away our agency. Um, and that's what I would, would not have hoped, you know, through the discussion that, that we are provoking today. <laughs> so can I just add, I'm reminded, and I've looked for this article for a long time, but there's an old article from the 70s, as I remember, um, about when Brazilian schools of social work adopted a Freirean approach. And after several years, their students couldn't get jobs because uh, traditional social work agencies and the government didn't want to hire revolutionaries. They wanted to hire whatever. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, great discussion. Uh, I think Verena wants to come in again, yes. We can't hear you, you are muted. I just wanted to say I cannot see if there's any contributions from the room. So if there's any, they can go first because I have already made a lot of contributions. No, we can't see any. No, there's Serena and then we Yeah, okay. So well, maybe she can start. Yeah, sure. Just didn't. Who wanted to say something in the room? I think it was. Oh, no? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, did we? Be... But I just wondered if there was somebody else here in the back that we are not overlooking. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> well, well, I, I wanted to come in to try and uh, provide an antidote for darkness in the room. <laughs> yeah, we worked up. I have a creation that she was just about to um, submit her thesis. She's been doing a PhD on. Um, in, in the UK, we have what's called like age assessment for asylum ch uh, children who are asylum seeking children. And there's been lots of controversy in politics around social workers assessing people's age and bio biological income and so things like that. And so, she, so her PhD was how do, how do social workers deal with these ethical kind of challenges? Because that's in a sense what you're confronted with. Yeah, you're confronted with, you know, this is in Foucault's kind of. Uh, the structures of the profession and then this desire to do something that's right. And she hypothesized that uh, the managers would be the enforcers and that the frontline practitioners would be the ones that are trying to work in the gaps and the cracks and the subversive. Her data proves the opposite. What her, and, and which I was shown because they think about managerialism. She found that the managers were doing all kinds of creative accounting in order that money could be made available for refugees and how they could try to stop them being deported and how you could challenge other agencies. So I think that the, I think we need to be wary about this kind of binary kind of view that social workers are all bad luck 
And I was thinking about Alinsky's work there, the street level bureau bureaucrats. That in that, you know, I think as professionals, you know, we are employed by the state, maybe, not always, uh, or the neoliberal state team, or even private business. But we still have, you know, I mean, that, that's what service users do, they're subversive, we can be subversive. The worst that can, that can happen to us, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I've been subversive and academic for 30 odd years, have been sacked. They should have sacked me, but I haven't been sacked. <laughs> um, so maybe that there is, you know, there are cracks, as it were, in the system that we've been working. As John Holloway would say, we work in the cracks. Yeah. And make them bigger. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, that's the discussion we need to have, you know, how can we be more subversive, you know, how, you know, what you've been saying, Paul, you know, what kind of theories and approaches are we teaching at the universities, you know, what kind of practice does this lead, you know, what's, yeah, what's the function of social work in all this against, you know, the oppressive institutional regimes that we might be changing from the inside or the outside, or maybe it has to be an alliance of both, you know, but we have to clear what social Social work is about, you know, and at the moment we don't have it clear, yeah. But maybe it's happening. Maybe it's happening, but because to keep the subversiveness of it, you can't publicize it. Maybe maybe we are being disingenuous to social workers. But you can't publicize it. Well, well, if you don't advertise it, you're being subversive. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't publish a paper saying, I've been subversive. Mm -hmm. Or you write a review or report to your manager. By the way, I did 10 subversive activities last week. <laughs> you know, it's a bit like the hidden curriculum. Maybe there is a hidden activism there. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just seeing social work as instrumental in this system. Where's the we have to give them agency as well, shall we? Why are we training these students to be social workers if they haven't got agency? But we can talk about these themes at the university. You rightly said you haven't been sucked so far. Me as well, I haven't been sucked so far, you know. So the question is, you know, what kind of approaches are we teaching? You know, what kind of uh, approaches to resistance, you know, um, are we discussing with students? Are we participating? Are we going out participating in, you know, demonstrations and manifestations um, as lecturers, you know, when it comes to defending the rights of refugees, for example? Are we a good example at all, you know? What is the model we are teaching, you know? I think we have to start with ourselves pretty much. I think the reason we have to finish at 8 o'clock is that my book was in. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe because um, yeah, no. Verena no, 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 wanted no, no, no. to perhaps give us a last two or three yeah. minute comment or question for, for thinking that you can take with us and then we have to close the session. Otherwise, we'll be locked out here in the building. Sure. No, my, my comment, I think, uh, really illustrates or like um, also tells how um, uh, how important that is to also change the system from within and in teaching. And just a short example, when I was once a, a contributing in a teaching session at a, at a master's studies of social work at a program. And they are like specialized in migration. They know all about decolonial, post-colonial approaches and so on. And, but they were unable to really make a connection to what does that mean for my social work practice. And that really hit me. And that's really, I think, what we have to do. We need to understand that in order to decolonize, we need to first reflect on our own privileges. It's not just about knowledge. It's also about being able to really realize your own privileges, your, your, to really feel it, to, to really know um, that it exists and, and to also really understand on various levels how uh, toxic the system is we live in. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks <laughs> so, I think, a lot. <laughs> I think you have said yeah. a very nice. Um,